mark. It is week seven. If you're just joining us, thank you for being a part today. If you're watching at a later date, thank you for watching. Uh, but we've been digging through Mark here, pretty much verse by, uh, chapter by chapter. We're in Mark chapter seven. And um, I want to begin reading with verse number one. It says this, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are so and there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Verse six, he answered and said to them, Well, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other things, such as you do. And he said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother and he who curses his father and mother, let me put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift from God, that you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God no effect through our tradition, which was handed down, and, and many such things you do. Verse 14, and he called the multitude of himself. He said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he entered into the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable, and he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it is not it is not enter because it does not enter his stomach, but his heart, but his stomach that is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, thefts, covenants, weakness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and defile a man. One of the greatest perils, if I could suit, use that term today, and something that puts all of us that are part of the body of Christ in grave dan danger, that will ultimately distort our view and remove us from the sense and need of God's mercy and grace in our life. It will seduce us with temptation that has troubled people in the church for generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. And it really is highlighted here. And I'm going to use this today as we describe what we're really talking about. And we're going to use this as a contrast today. And I'll use this term as a definition. I want to talk about the difference between a heart, a life built with a heart, and moralism. And before you go, wait a minute, what are we doing here in Mark talking about moralism? We're going to get into this using this passage because there's a slippery slope that we can all go down that is absolutely something that I see that is plaguing the church in general and plaguing people that are trying to walk with Jesus Christ, and it's the attitude of moralism, or it's the posture of moralism. I will tell you right off the bat that Jesus Christ did not come to establish a moral code. Jesus did not come to make us morally good. He came 
that his mercy and grace would work in us. This is part of the issue we have with Christianity as a whole. Because the world looks at Christianity as a moral a moral ascension. And the world doesn't understand why Christians can be Christians, but yet have things in their life that are not moral. I'm not excusing today, nor will I excuse here in the next few minutes, um, the idea that we can do whatever we want to do, we can go wherever we want to do, we can have fun, and it's all under God's mercy and grace. I'm not, I'm not uh, giving a license to sin today. Do what you want to do. I believe that we're all held accountable by our actions, our deeds, our thoughts, our conduct. I believe that we need to follow Christ in everything that we do. I think it needs to be reflected not only on the inside, but should be reflected on the outside in our, in our lifestyle and who we are as people. But to say that Christianity is about moral, moral, uh, uh, moral behavior is truly stripping away the essence of what it really means to follow Jesus Christ. So that's why it's been said before, and I'll say it again, that's why there's going to be a lot of bad people in heaven and a lot of good people that end up lost. Why? Because today your relationship with God and your your salvation is not based on your good or your bad. It's simply based on the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. We're going to see that today in Mark chapter 7 because this part here in Mark chapter 7 really illustrates a bigger point and a greater message that Jesus Christ came to give and Jesus Christ came to present. Because let's be frank, I know a lot of people today that are not in church. I know a lot of people today that are sitting at home today not doing anything religious but have high moral standards. Does their morality save them? Absolutely not. So if their morality saves them, our morality as believers cannot save us. Now I'm going to jump back and forth today. I'm going to be talking to those of you that consider yourselves to be believers. I'm going to talk about some of you that may be just on your journey to find Jesus Christ today. I believe there's two parts to this. But for those of you that have been walking with Jesus, if we're not careful, we will begin to define where we are, who we are, and how we live based off a moral code and not the posture of our heart. So let's get into this if we can. Because as we look at Mark chapter 7, well, we find ourselves really in what probably is one of the most pivotal passages in all of Mark. It's sort of almost here in the middle. There's 16 chapters at Mark. This is Mark chapter 7. So we're kind of getting to the middle of Mark and we're really starting to see some things. And probably this is one of the most theological passages in Mark. Mark doesn't really go into a lot of theology. But this is a huge theological, has a lot of things broken down. So let's take a moment, if we can, break down this passage, and then we're going to get into more of the meat. Uh, this passage really marches us to the cross because it defines this once and for all collision between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees that ends up ultimately uh, determining the fact that Jesus Christ would die and leads us to this this sort of climatic moment of Calvary. But it also is a greater passage because not only is it show us the conflict that eventually leads to Jesus' death, but it also defines within us the need for the cross of Calvary for you and I today. Because it is Jesus' diagnostic test on the condition of the heart. And if Jesus and his diagnostic test is right, there is no hope. And I say this one more time, and I'll say this numerous times over the next few minutes. There is no hope, absolutely no hope for us without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. None. Jesus gives the diagnostic here after this confrontation with the Pharisees over the washing of the hands. He comes back, says it to them, and then reiterates it again with their with his disciples that there is no hope. He doesn't say this, but this is where we're heading. There is no hope for any of us without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because 
Actions alone cannot change you. Trying to be a better person today is not what's going to save you. It cannot change you. You can follow every moral code today. You can follow every religious code, but that does not make you one ounce more saved than you were before you started. The only hope any of us have today, the only hope that the world has today, is the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. So let's take it a little further. You got the history, right? I'll just go back with it again. The Pharisees had sort of rejected the claims that Jesus was the Christ, and they're now following him around, but a lot of the following around really was trying to entrap him. There was numerous, and out throughout the Gospels, we find many, many times where the Pharisees are sort of laying this trap, trying to get Jesus to say something he shouldn't have said, or to blaspheme, blaspheme, uh, blaspheme God. There's all these traps, and Jesus so many times perceives their thoughts, perceives their actions, and sort of out uh, maneuvers them and kind of entraps them instead of them entrapping him. And we see this again. Here's again, they've got him. They finally, here's another, they're finally trying to disprove and bring sort of this uh, um, um, uh, uh, discredit part to who Jesus is. And now they have another opportunity to do that. And that is, we've got you because we just saw your disciples eating food without washing their hands and therefore if they're doing that they're breaking the code and if they're breaking the code they're no good and because they follow you and do what you do that means you're no good we win and we see this play out over the first few verses of this now let's go a little further because this is important to understand context here this law that they're referring to was not a law of God that was being broken. There was no law that we find in the word of God that was being broken. What really had happened is that the scribes and the Pharisees had, had gone through, they'd studied the law, and in the seriousness of the law, they had interpreted, reinterpreted, and then re-reinterpreted, and they had applied, reapplied, and then re-reapplied until their obedience had become this superstructure of religious uh, regulations that ultimately just overwhelmed people. I, I could go through the details today. It's not relevant. But if you went through all the things that they added on and above what God had said as they interpreted and reinterpreted and re-reinterpreted and applied and applied and reapplied and re-reapplied, and ultimately all these things began to just overwhelm people. And one of those is illustrated here with washing and this idea of washing and becoming undefiled or clean before you're eating. And we see this in verses 3 through verse 5 that Mark actually makes sort of this editorial comment to the Jewish readers. Because again, those that were, would, would, would have been reading Mark at the time would have had some knowledge of some Jewish traditions. And so he kind of makes this uh, um little editorial to note because he takes it just beyond washing of hands and he goes through and he says this he says um, the tradition of washing had gotten bigger than just simply washing hands and he says oh by the way there were regulations about washing cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches uh, and basically saying that these people got washing obsessed Mark kind of throws that in there why is that important because a person's standing and their, and their walk with God was beginning to be determined and judged by their adherence to this moral code that was laid down by the Pharisees. And they were judged by the way they would keep these traditions and their knowledge of them and their obedience to them. That's the context here. The context is... If people aren't doing what we're telling them and leaving to this moral code that's going above and beyond, they're wrong. They're defiling themselves. And ultimately, they're, if they're defiled, then they cannot truly be called the children of God. But there's a bigger point here. Because this is going to sound very familiar to those of you that were along 
the study of the anatomy of a disciple, this is going to sound very similar because there's something greater here than just simply the conflict of Jesus and the Pharisees. That what's happening here really illustrates this greater fight between moralism or externalism, if you want to call it that, and ultimately what true biblical faith is, but what moralism does to faith. And we look through this passage with the lens of this conflict, more than just a conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus, more than just Jesus calling them out, but really this conflict that really still rages on today, and it's the conflict of action and outward lifestyle becoming the determining factor of me and my heart. Now, I will say this as a disclaimer. In no way am I saying that outside and what we do outside doesn't matter. And God forbid, you could go do whatever you want. Jesus loves you and let's have a party. That's not what this is about. Neither am I saying that's what it's about. Really, this is a, a, a contrast in the foundation of how you are going to walk with Jesus Christ. What is going to be the foundation? What is your walk with Jesus Christ going to be built on? Is it going to be built on actions and moralism and externalism and how you appear and look? Or is it going to be based in true biblical faith? Because it can't have both. And in a few minutes, hopefully, you'll start to see if there's some areas in your life that you're actually not living with a heart of faith. You're actually living with Good, good deeds, good actions, good thoughts. That's what God wants. You see, the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. I can't, if I was good, if I could become good, I already would have become good. I can't become good. Only by his grace and mercy in the cross of Calvary. So the first thing you'll notice here, it's very clear that the Pharisees' critique of the disciples that moralism, and I keep using that term because that's the safest term. There's others I could use, but I'm going to be very safe today and just use the term moralism. If you are catching on and all, you know there's other things we could put in that. There's other synonyms we could use, religious words we could use, but we'll be safe today and use moralism. That moralism causes you to be more concerned with behavior of others than the spirit con condition of your own heart. Moralism, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of you that can help fill in the blank of other synonyms that we can use for moralism. But moralism and the other synonyms that go along with that calls us to be more concerned with the behavior of others than the spiritual condition of our own heart. Watch this. Think about the men who were, talk, who were making this minute, really minute little critique of the disciples who were outraged that the disciples hadn't gone through the detailed cleansing of hands. There were literally volumes, literally volumes written on exactly the procedures by which to wash your hands. And they were absolutely appalled with this little tiny context of hungry men eating without going through all these rituals that they, they just couldn't understand how this could be the case, especially the fact that these men were disciples of Jesus Christ. But let's look, who were these men? Ultimately, these men were men that were in great spiritual peril because ultimately they were standing against the only hope that is in the universe, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. They were rejecting the prophesied Messiah that they had read about and in some ways even believed to be. They were rejecting the Messiah that was promised and removing the only hope of redemption. And it was coming down to, instead of seeing the power of the hope of Jesus Christ, they're over there nitpicking at some little fine detail of the washing of hands that wasn't even in the Word of God. Now, for those of you that know me, and you're not new, and you know me for a while, you know the restraint that I'm showing today. Because there are so many things that we could apply to this situation that are direct comparison 
to the condition of the church and the people in the church. I'll just put it this way. We want to nitpick people with some of the finest of little details in their life that we miss the greatest message of all of this, and that is the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. I am baffled. I couldn't do it, Lord. Give me your grace today. Can't, I can't let it go. I am baffled at some of the things that people have pointed out in others' lives. Small, minute things that have pushed people away from Jesus. Why? The church should represent the true essence of Jesus Christ. The church should represent a place where the broken and the hurting and the abused and the outcast and the misbehaving and the unbelieving want to come to. But yet, why does the church now seem so unappealing to that? We love Jesus. We don't really like the church. There's a statistic. I'll get it out here in a minute. I'll start speaking in tongues as I do it. There's a, a statistic that I came across asking people what they thought about church. And in the end, the, church, the, the statistic was something along the lines of only 30% of people said they would want to attend a church, but over 95% of people believed in who Jesus Christ was. Why is there such a contrast to this? I'm speaking to Antioch West today for a few moments because this is at the core of what God is trying to do because there's a message of hope that needs to be delivered, but we can't deliver that message of hope if we don't acknowledge some things in our life that we need to change and some ideologies have got to die once and for all. And I promise you, by the help and grace of God, as long as I'm leading this body, I'm going to chase every single spirit down that promotes this. But if 30% of people are willing to try a church, but over 90% believe in who Jesus is, why is there a 60% gap? Why is there a 60%? So take 100 people, and 30 of those people are willing to try a church, but over 90 of those people are willing and believe who Jesus is. Why is there 60 people that believe who Jesus is but are not willing to give church a try? What does that tell you? Oh, well, you know, we can go through the list. We can, we can justify it all we want. Bottom line is because the same attitude and spirit that was alive when Jesus was there is still prevalent in the church today. We have taken down discipleship, and we have replaced it with moralism. Let's call it what it is. Religion, legalism, whatever you want to call it today. Externalism. We have replaced true discipleship, true walking with Jesus Christ, true nature of Christ with this attitude that if I can follow all these rules, the problem with that is, is that we see it here. Moralism, externalism, legalism, religious, religion is always, every single time, forgive me for being passionate, but I'm trying to, be, trying to get across what I feel in my spirit. It's always, always, always connected with a condemning spirit. Now I know all of a sudden I, can, I'm not even, I don't even know who's watching or not. I can just sense when I say things like that. People like, okay, I'm off. That's okay. That's all right. If you find me somebody with a condemning spirit, if you find me somebody that's always looking about others and judging others and doesn't come with a spirit of humility, doesn't come with a spirit of love and grace and mercy, I'll tell you somebody and show you somebody that's really moralism, externalism, legalism, and ultimately who is bound by religion. Because those are the breeding ground of a condemning spirit. Let me ask you that. Is that you? 
oh, well, maybe we do it now. We're a lot more passive aggressive with it than we used to be. Back in the day, someone comes to church, some loving person goes, walks up to them right away and says, hey, if you're going to come here, here are the things you're going to need to do. We don't do that anymore. We've, we've moved past that. We're a lot smarter about it. We do it a little more passive aggressively, but the attitude's still the same. I said it last week, the uh, principle's the same, but the, the moment matches, the, met the method matches the moment. The principle is still the same, but we've just changed the method to match the moment. So now we do it a little differently. We do it just a little differently. We tweak it, but it's still the same. How do we tweak it? Here's one way we tweak it. We tweak it because now, instead of about going, we've made it about coming. We are not being the church. We're doing church. Well, that's the big deal. The big deal is this. If you're going to go to church or you're going to do church, you're ultimately setting yourself up to participate in the attitude and the spirit of moralism because it's going to be about what we're doing, not who we are. But Jesus commanded us to go. If you're going to go, it changes the perspective. Instead of people looking at you from the outside, you're looking at them through the lens of Christ. The problem was, we see it. As these men are over here critiquing the disciples for the washing of the hands, they couldn't even see their own spiritual peril. They couldn't see it. They were blinded by their own spiritual condition. Because they couldn't see it, they were so worried about the fact that these guys were eating without washing their hand, which was absolutely appalling. But in that, they couldn't even see the condition of their own spiritual being. And Jesus starts to point it out because he says, these people honor me with their lips, verse 6, but their heart is far from me. Moralism, religion, legalism, externalism, go through all the words you can use as a synonym to that. Always emphasizes external behavior and ignores the heart. I'm going to say that again. Moralism, religion, legalism, external, whatever you want to put on there, always emphasizes the external and ignores the heart. Listen to what I'm saying to you today. True discipleship, true Christianity, True walking, true walking with Jesus is always and will always be a matter of the heart. God will not be satisfied with your words. He will not be satisfied with your behavior. He will not be satisfied with your knowledge. He will not be satisfied with your public acts of religion. He wants your heart. To understand this, let's take a moment if we can and let's look at the theology of the heart that's given to us in Scripture. And we've talked about this now for the last three years here, part of Antioch West. Those of you that were a part of Antioch West, you know that. We've talked about this. We're doing it again today. The Lord's put this back in my spirit again and again because some of you still don't get it. The heart is the center of our personhood. The heart is being the seed of our thoughts, our desires, our emotions, our motivations, our values. The heart is your control center. The heart is the steering wheel of your life. And that means this, that what rules your heart will rule your life and your behavior. What owns your heart owns the essence of what is you. I got to say that again. If the heart is the control center, if the heart is the steering wheel of our life, then that means this. What rules your heart rules your life and your behavior. And what owns your heart owns the essence of what is you. Because of that, that's why God is after your heart because if he doesn't have your heart he doesn't have you and so it's not enough to jump through behavioral hoops when your heart is really 
being ruled by other gods. That's why this is not just simply semantics. It's not simply a man, I'm just sitting here on another tangent. Here's Pastor Joel again on his soapbox, banging the drum. This is the essence of everything. I gotta say that again. That's why God is after your heart today. It's not simply because God wants to control you because your heart is everything to him. Because if he doesn't have your heart, he doesn't have you. Do everything you want. Jump through every hoop. Do every, dot every I and cross every T. You can come and worship and lift your hands and do everything right and still be wrong. Because you can do that and your heart still be owned by another God. Look at the conflict throughout the Gospels. Jesus constantly comparing, how can one man serve two masters? You're going to choose your masters. Wait a minute, but I do all these things. I come to church. I participate here. I read my Bible. I say my prayers. I do this. I'm doing all the deeds necessary. You're right, but who owns your heart? That's the question today that God wants me to ask you. That's the question today that you've got to answer. Who owns your heart? And you go, well, well, what do you, well, how do I know what owns my heart? Well, look at all the things I do. What you do does not determine who owns your heart. Because let's go back it again. The heart is the center of your personhood. It's the seed of your thoughts, your desires, your emotions, your motivations, your values. It's the steering wheel of your life. It's the control center. What rules your heart rules your life and your behavior. What owns your heart ultimately owns you. I, I don't have to look at the things that you do on Sunday. That doesn't determine who owns your heart. What determines who owns your heart is what you do on Monday or Tuesday or when no one's watching. It's not the action that God's looking about. He's looking about ownership. God doesn't want to modify your actions today. He wants to become the king and lord of your heart. That's why the church is gotten so off course because the church wants to get into behavioral modification. If you want to become a follower of Jesus Christ, here's the things you can do and here's the things you shouldn't do. And then we're going to make sure everybody adheres to that. That's not true Christianity. That's moralism. It's legalism. It's externalism. It's religion. Forgive me for being passionate, but I'm not, I'm not asking you to forgive me for following the scripture because ultimately it's this. If we're going to affect the world and reach the world, we've got to have him as the Lord of our heart because ultimately we're not trying to tell people how to change their behavior. We're trying to show people how Jesus can come and rule their heart. That's why the church is so ineffective to the world around us. That's why the world continues to go into decay, why the church pats themselves on the back because we feel we had a great time today or man, that was a great message or wow, that was a great song or wow, we had a great gathering today and we're going, this is awesome because we're doing all these things but really ultimately the church is not the church on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday because we are showing our change in our behavior but we really don't let Jesus rule our heart. That's why in Isaiah 1, you have these shocking words where Jesus says, I hate your solemn assemblies. I hate your sacrifices. They're an abomination to me. Why? Because they were not an expression of your heart. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. He told them to do these things, but he says, I hate your assemblies. I hate your sacrifices. They're an abomination to me. Why? Because they're not done out of your heart. The heart is a worship center. You're always worshiping. You don't just worship on Sunday. You worship your way through every moment of every day. So I'll ask you, on the ground level of your life, in the hallways, in the kitchens, in the bedrooms, in the family rooms, in the cars, in the buses, in the planes of, of everyday life, what functionally and effectively rules your heart what we have great spiritual rhetoric religious rhetoric to cover up the fact what rules you what do you want what do you crave is jesus christ your lord in all of your life's domains you see faith 
to be true faith is first a matter of the heart. Obedience to be true obedience is a matter of the heart. That's why Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount moves the fences of the law, not just to behavior, but moves them to the heart. Why? Here he said this, right? He goes this, adultery is not just a physical act of adultery, but adultery is a matter of the heart. If you look at a woman and lust after her, you're already committed adultery. Now, is Jesus changing the law? No, he's trying to go to say, wait a minute, the law is not simply about obedience. The law is about the matter of the heart. This is not about the right of divorce. This is not about whether or not you're allowed to divorce or not. This is not about God changing things. Wait a minute, Jesus, no, Jesus didn't change the law. Jesus was talking about the posture of the heart. He's like saying, wait a minute, you, you can do all these things right, but if the heart's not there, this is Isaiah 1 repeated all over again. So it's not about the fact of the physical act of, of adultery. It's about what's in your heart is more important because you can never do these things externally, but if your heart is not postured correctly, all of the external doesn't matter. Moralism completely, religion it completely ignores the heart. But there's a third thing here that we find. This religious idea, this moralism, elevates doable human tradition to the status of God's law. I want to say that again. I wrote that down. I'm going to say that again. The problem is when we follow this, it elevates doable human tradition and puts it on the same posture as God's law. Why is that important? Well, it's important because ultimately I can't change myself. It's but by his grace. Religion tries to give me a path where I can become my own savior. It smells like God, looks like God. It actually has a lot of good qualities to it, but the source of it is not the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. The source of it is I'm becoming a better person. Look at what I'm doing. Why? Verse 7, in vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Meaning, you have taken these things and you have placed them on elevating and levels I never intended them to be at. Man, there's so many things I could get into that I'm going to move along. If my trust is in my ability to keep God's laws or rules, whatever you want to call them today, then it would make sense that I'd want to get it right. And so I would think about it. I would define. I would redefine. I would interpret. I would reinterpret. I would apply. I would reapply all those applications, all those interpretations, and begin to view them at the same importance and obedience to God's law. Sound familiar? I'd go through everything. I'd, I'd make sure I, everything I find too calm and everything I got was perfectly right. Am I saying we should just go off and do our own thing? No, I'm not saying that today at all. But the problem is this. Our problem is an eternal problem. So the acts of external behavior do not solve the problem. If your problem was just behavior, then the law could provide rescue. But your problem is not behavior. Your problem is your very nature. Your problem is the essence of who you are. Your problem is you. My problem is me. It is not what I do. It is not changing my behavior. It's my problem. My problem is me. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my brother, not my sister, Lord. It's standing in the need of prayer. It's me. My problem is not first physical, immorality, but an immoral heart that wants things that are outside God's will for me, that craves for the pleasures of immorality more than I crave the honor of God. My problem is not physical stealing, but a materialistic, covetous heart that seems never to be satisfied. It's kind of like saying it like this. You can't just eat one cookie, right? For years, I begged my wife because I could not resist eating more than one Chips Ahoy. 
I'm salivating right now. Thank you, Jesus. It's been a while. She put the chips ahoy in the pantry or the cabinet. And I would go through all these hoops mentally because I didn't want to eat the whole package because I knew eating the whole package wasn't good for me. But I couldn't resist the taste of the chips, of the chocolate. Ooh, I felt the most anointing I've had all day right now, talking about them chocolate chip, chips ahoy. And so here's how I do it. I wouldn't dare take the package out of the cabinet because that would be make it way too convenient. And next thing I know, I'd eat the whole entire thing and I didn't realize it. I'd try to make it hard on myself. I would literally go to the cabinet, get up, walk into the kitchen to get one cookie thinking that if I could make it harder on myself, it would deter me from eating more cookies. So I would go all the way in the kitchen. I'd get that one cookie, come sit back down. I'd eat it. Hoping that the effort of going and getting another cookie would deter me from getting another one, and I would only eat one, and therefore I could have the pleasure of sin for a season. But I found myself more and more justifying, all right, well, I had one. I'll just go out and get another one. It won't be a big deal. But this time I went back and I thought, you know what? One did not satisfy my cravings. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab three because one didn't do it. So I'm going to triple my pleasure and hopefully tripling my pleasure and then having to walk would satisfy it and I'll just leave the cookies alone. So I grabbed three cookies. I go sit down. One cookie, two cookie, three cookie. And then after a few minutes, the craving for that other cookie began. And my deterrent of having to walk and get the cookie wasn't helping me. And then after a day or two, I'd go into the pantry or the cabinet. I'd pull up the Chips Ahoy and I'd go, why is there only like two cookies left? There was like a hundred in here. There's only two left. And I asked my wife, please, I'm begging you. Tell me someone ate, else ate these cookies. And she'd look at me and go, no, I don't think the kids ate them. And I would look at myself and go, sweet Jesus, I've eaten this entire package of cookies in the last day. But I didn't know it because I never sat down and ate the entire package. That would have been too obvious. I just nibbled here, nibbled there, nibbled here, nibbled there. Here's the problem. Here's the point. The problem wasn't with the Chips Ahoy. The problem wasn't with the chocolate chips. The problem wasn't the cookie. And ultimately, the problem wasn't making it harder to get to the cookie them, the chip them, the pleasure of the hoys of the chips. That wasn't helping me because the problem wasn't the cookie. The problem was me. The problem was me. I can't blame the cookies for me. I can't take the cookies away because removing the cookies is only putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound because it's not teaching me how to discipline myself. It's only removing the problem, but only pushing the problem onto something else. So if it's not cookies, another one is you can go to Sam's or Costco and get that jar of M&Ms, the big peanut and ms You know what I'm talking about. Those big tubes of M&Ms, same thing. One M&M at a time. So if it wasn't cookies, it was M&M. It wasn't M&M, it was something else. Why? Because the issue wasn't what was in the house. The issue was me. I can proudly report today that of the last period of time, the chips of hoy have come into the house. There are actually some up there right now but I have not partaken of them. Glory be to God, but by his grace. Why? I'm not trying to get onto that today. I'm using it as a point. Is it the problem with the cookies or is the problem with me? The problem is we've tried to make all of this about the issues. Of, well, the world's so bad. Man, the world's just horrible. Do you see all those stuff out there in the world? Here's what we should do. Let's close ourselves in from the big bad world. And if we get away from the big bad world, we'll be better people. And why is that the case? The more good we become, the worse Christians we are. 
The more we abstain, the more critical we become. The more we stop doing things, the more detached from Jesus we become. Because the issue is not cookies today, my friend. The issue is you and I and the posture and the attitude and who owns our heart. So we can sit up from pulpits today in the name of Jesus. Lord, give me grace today, but I'm on it. We can stand up from pulpits and we can blast everybody for chips ahoys and cookies and M&Ms and say bad, 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 bad. Get rid of all of it. And we have people going home and cleaning out their pantries and saying, well, if I get rid of all the cookies, then I'll be okay. But the problem is... It goes from cookies to, to the internet. It goes from the internet to something else. Because why? We're not addressing the problem. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Cookies are not my problem. M&Ms are not my problem. Ice cream is not my problem. I am the problem. That's why at Antioch West, if you watch us at all, if you pay attention to anything at all, I'm not going to get on cookies. I'm not going to get on M&Ms. I'm not going to go down the list of do's and don'ts here, part of Antioch West. Some of you don't like that. Tell me what to do, Pastor. Tell me. Because you know what? Cookies are my problem, but ice cream may be your problem. You know what? I don't really like cake. I don't, I, I'm going to break it down for you. I don't like any kind of pie. I know. Some of you just passed out. Chocolate pie, cherry pie, blueberry pie, lemon pie, pumpkin pie. Any pie. I don't like it. It would be easy for me today to sit up here and go, you know what? You shouldn't eat pie. Because pie is bad. And I could get on the pie soapbox day and say, you know what? All of you out there who are eating pie, shame on you for eating pie. Because you know what? I don't really care about pie. And while you're abstaining from your pie, I'm over there pounding away on my chocolate chip cookies because that is, that's what heaven's going to serve when we get there. It's going to be just cookies from heaven's bakery. Come on, Jesus. Calorie free. So I could bang on your pie today because pie's not my problem. But let's not talk about cookies. Ooh, I'm on it today. Ooh, I know, I know food could preach. Let's not talk about cookies, because cookies are my problem. Let's talk about your problem. Get out of the pie. God forbid we talk about cookies. So that's what the church has become. We become experts at identifying everybody else's pie while we hide our cookies in our pockets. Woo! I wish I had them geese today, because they would be giving me an amen. I'm going to have a, a, a sound effects of the flocking of the geese. So the problem with the church, no wonder the world thinks we're, we're messed up. No wonder the world thinks, why would I want to be a part of the church of the living God? Because the world sees it. We don't. We're blinded by it. Everybody's sitting around that day. I imagine they went, really, these dudes are seriously fussing about the fact of washing their hands when these guys were just hungry? The world looks at us and goes, you guys are the just... What's wrong with you? You guys are over there banging on pie and how bad pie is, but you guys are eating cookies by the package. And we're going... Yes, but pie is very bad for you. But don't look over here. Our chips ahoy are just, they're not really for you. We wonder why the world doesn't want to be a part of the body of Christ. You know what? Be honest with you. We're not very good representations of Jesus Christ. Because we want to put the finger on everything else but the real problem. It's me because it's a matter of the heart. So today... I'm not telling you to go throw out the cookies. Go buy cookies. Buy Oreos, Chips Ahoy, Famous Amos, Nestle Toll House, Nutter Butter, whatever other cookie fits your fancy. Pile them up. That's not the point. The point is you. The point is me. The point is my heart. We don't have a cookie problem. We have a heart problem. We don't have a pie problem. We have a heart problem. We've made it about pies and ice cream. And therefore, the way to fix that is let's just eliminate pies and ice cream. Because if we eliminate pies and ice cream, that makes us feel better because we're not participating in those things. But really, we just substitute pies and ice cream for other things. 
the church pats ourselves on the back. We no longer partake in the eating of cookies. But yet we're filled with pride, arrogance, haughty spirits, judgment, critique, selfishness. Do you want to keep going? Am I close enough to where you are? We run our own life, make our own decisions. We walk with a mind of carnality. We fit God into our life at our convenience. We don't get up and make him the Lord of our life and submit to him. But we're okay because we stopped eating cookies. You know what? I'd rather you eat cookies and stop that other junk than to say here today, look at all I'm doing, I'm okay. And you know what's funny? The world sees it better than we do. Non-believers see it and believers are blinded by it. That's the crazy thing. Because we as a church want to tell, we don't eat cookies. And the world's going, what does that matter? Because when the world sees us, they see backbiting, contention, covetousness, competition, backstabbing. If you don't believe it, how many of you, when you go out and you see a church person out at Walmart, what do you do? Do you run up to them and go, man, it's good to see a brother or sister here today. Man, it's great to see you. You know what you do? Don't sit there and act like you don't. You see a church person, what do you do? You go to the other aisle. You go to the other side of the store. Why? Do you know why? Because you don't want to be judged. You don't want to be critiqued. You know what? Oh, why not? I'm already so deep into it now. It is what it is. I've run into church people at Walmart. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what? Instead of having a conversation, they sit there and they look at all the stuff in my cart. Judging what I'm buying. So to be honest with you, I'm just going to throw it out there. There's some people, if I'm in Walmart and I see them, I go the other direction. <gasps> you can't do that. That's not godly. You know, right? Jesus is working on me. You pray for me, why don't you, since I'm in such peril. But you know why? Because I don't want to be judged by what's in my cart. Now, I'm not buying things. I'm not buying sinful stuff at Walmart. Chill out. But I don't want to mess. I don't even want to go around that spirit. That's who we are. And then we really think we're going to have people find Jesus among our midst when we can't even stand each other. Come be a part of our community. We don't like each other, but hey, it's great. <laughs> Come to Antioch West. It's awesome. I don't like anybody here, but hey, if you're going to go to heaven, you might as well suffer here, okay? But we're going to change the world. Come on. Really? That's why the problem, honestly, we can have all the prayer meetings we want. We can have all the worship services we want. We can do all the things we want. And that's why we'll never affect anybody. Because let's be honest, we ourselves are not affected. I must first become a disciple before I can make a disciple. I must first be changed before I can help others change. Antioch West, I have other things here. God is not going to allow me to get to today. I'm coming to a close and this is where the Lord brought us to. And for some of you... Uh, come back next week. There'll probably be something for you. But today in the Holy Ghost, I'm speaking to that spirit one more time. Your days are numbered. There's no room for you here. And I speak under the boldness of the Holy Ghost. I, pr I pray that 
every single person that wants to fellowship with that spirit. And you're going to call this body your church home. I'm praying now in Jesus' name that you will be uncovered and the sheep's clothing will be pulled off of you and you will be exposed for the wolf you are. And if I am the shepherd of this flock, it is my desire to protect this flock and the other ones that we're bringing into the 99s. And I refuse to let the wolves walk around any longer disguised in their externalism, their moralism, and their sheep's clothing. Today, I'm telling you the Holy Ghost, your days are over in this body because there is a world out there that is hurting that Jesus Christ is leading us to. But I refuse to let the broken come into a place where their brokenness is going to be exposed instead of healed, where their sins are going to be uncovered instead of covered. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. So you know what? I say this again, and I probably shouldn't say it online, but it is what it is at this point in time. If I'm not fired by now, I'm just going to keep rolling with Jesus. This is the hill I'm willing to die on. Don't push me, because you're not pushing me. You're pushing the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you, I'm going to pray you out of this body. Because this body is going to be a place of healing, of hope. This body is going to be a place where anybody, no matter who they are, no matter their lifestyle, no matter their choices, is going to be able to find Jesus Christ, and find healing and hope and refuge. Changing them is not our, it's, it's not our, it's not our burden. It's his burden. Our burden is to love them, to care for them. It's his to change them because changing them is not about modifying their behavior. It's about who's going to own your heart. There's some major controversial things in this world. There's some massive moral issues at stake in this world. There's agendas, and I'll just leave it at that, that are being promoted every day in advertising on TV that are hanging outside of people's houses that are promoting agendas that are contrary to the word of God. But I will tell you this, it is not the church's job to go out there and to fight a moral battle. It's the church's job to stand up and be the love of Jesus Christ and let Jesus Christ be the one that changes it. Because it's not about changing behavior, it's about who's going to rule the heart. So before you point fingers at someone else before their behavior, you need to check and see who's sitting on the throne of your heart. Because if we don't get this solved, what does it matter if we go through the entire book of Mark and pull out all these great little spiritual nuggets? If this is not defeated, all of that is a giant big facade and waste. You know what? I said this before, I'll say it again. I can't speak for you, I'm speaking for, as for me and my house, this is what God has called us to be about. You gotta make your own decision. But we've gotta look hard at ourselves. Stop looking at the chocolate chips. Start looking at you. It's me, it's me, oh Lord. Not to, we can tear down every Chips Ahoy factory in America. That's not solving the problem. We can remove every M&M off the shelf. Not solving the problem. We can take ice cream out of the grocery stores doesn't solve the problem because it's not ice cream, cookies, and M&Ms. It's us that need to change because it's our heart that is not under the lordship and the rulership of Jesus Christ. End of story. Drop it. That's it. That's it. End of story. Father, I pray today by the power of your spirit that as you begin to continue to prick our heart and reveal to us our heart, that by your grace, you would help us to be honest with ourselves. Let the spirit of conviction fall upon us today. Reveal to us the posture of our heart, the attitude, but more importantly, the lordship and the rulership of our heart. Some of us don't realize you're not on the throne of our heart. 
we think because of our actions and the things and the duties that we fulfill that equates to lordship, but it doesn't. Father, I pray today that a spirit of conviction would be upon your church, your people, that those of us that have a desire to know you and walk with you, but have fallen under the trap, under the seduction, under the, the, the deception of moralism, of religion, that it can be free today. I take dominion and authority over the spirit of religious tradition that blinds our minds and hearts today. I curse it in the name of Jesus and I pray that our eyes would be open that we can see. Let it be done in the name of Jesus today. Spirit of religious tradition, I command you to loose us and set us free. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Let us see the light of the glorious of the gospel. Let us see the vision of the cross and the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ like we've never seen it before. But more importantly, Father, I'm asking you, rule my heart, rule my life. Be the Lord of my life in every moment of every day. In Jesus' name. Some of you may need to take a moment before you do anything else. You need to talk to Jesus today. Before you go upstairs and look at the Chips Ahoy or throw the Chips Ahoy out or go back and say, well, Pastor Wright says I can go buy Chips Ahoy. Never said you can go buy Chips Ahoy or not buy Chips Ahoy. Chips Ahoy aren't the problem. It's the heart that's the problem. You're the problem. And the only way to change that is for you to stand humble, naked, and exposed at the cross of Calvary and say, Lord, here I am. Every part of me. All of me. Every secret place, I give it to you. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We'll see you again next time.